So I was at the Milken conference last week and there were a lot of talks about whether we're going to see a hard landing and how asset managers are planning to navigate that. What is your economic outlook and expectation of default? <laughs> so you go right, right for the hard one, right at the beginning. <laughs> um, so uh, so not, to, not to macro prognosticate too much, but um, the way we think about the economic cycle right now is that we are somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. and monetary policy cycles take a very long time. And we think that's one thing the market's missing right now, and frankly, the credit markets are missing it, that if you look at patterns of monetary policy cycles, we're following basically the same pattern you've seen over and over again. You know, first you raise rates, then it hits credit sensitive areas of the economy. Once those credit, you know, housing, durable goods, um, you know, some consumer credit areas, uh, once those areas are hit, you start to have lower investment, you start to have CEO confidence decline, you start to have, you know, inventories reduced, some capital spending reduced, and eventually you get to about where we are, where leading indicators have declined for 12 months, CEO confidence is low, consumer confidence is low, PMIs are low, ISMs are fairly low, and then generally earnings start to decline. And once earnings start to decline, you actually get the monetary policy cycle working. You actually get the disinflation that you need because once earnings start to decline, companies start pulling back on expenses and frankly, they start pulling back on people. And I think the, the, you know, the unfortunate reality about monetary policy cycles is to get the consumer to spend less you need to get the consumer worried about their job. And, and we think the next six to 12 months are where you're going to see earnings start to decline and the consumers start to worry about their job, which will solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means for credit, um, if, if you want to go there, is um, there's a huge math problem in credit right now. And... Um, let's say the floating rate world, the, the levered loan world, the, the close to $2 trillion levered loan world, that's full of B-rated companies, single B-rated companies that are four to eight times levered, let's say. Mm -hmm. And when you take the risk-free rate and you move it from zero, where they raised all that debt, and you take it to 500 basis points, that's a big math problem for them. Their interest cost doubles, and we think that about 20% of that world is already free cash flow negative. And if we're right about where we are in the cycle and earnings start to decline, if they decline 10 to 15%, your typical recession, they'd decline 20 to 30%. If they decline 10 to 15%, we think 50% of that world is free cash flow negative, and that's a big problem. So, um, so we think the credit cycle will play out over the coming years, and, um, and there's a debt problem. Mm -hmm. And what do you see credit conditions looking like in the long term, given we have just seen three of the four largest U.S. bank failures in the past two months? Um, well, the interesting thing about monetary policy cycles is that they almost never get to the end. They usually break something, and that something that they break generally causes the disinflation that you need. Um, monetary policy cycles rarely ever just, you know, you raise rates, business slows down, consumers stop spending, you get to the end, and then monetary policy can be brought back down. It almost always results in you know, Orange County going bankrupt or a savings and loan crisis or, you know, a tech crisis or a housing crisis, and that crisis solves the problem. So a few very large, just about systemically important banks going down, mm -hmm. 500 billion of deposits coming out of the banking system, is not healthy. I don't think that anything has broken yet, but um, but it's 
it's not going to help earnings. Regional banks are the lifeblood of the economy. They're 40% of small business loans. They're 70%, 60 70% of real estate loans. That's a big issue that's not going to help the problem. Mm -hmm. Or certainly not going to help earnings. Yeah. So how do asset managers like King Street is poised to take advantage of that? or? Um, so today, we think you need to be very careful because of where we are in the cycle. Mm -hmm. Given we are only at the point where earnings start to decline, on the long side of King Street, we think you need to be very selective, very careful, avoid making mistakes, earn as much carry as possible, hopefully higher up in the capital structure without a lot of duration. And so that's how we're positioned right now. We're basically on the long side going to places that already don't have enough capital and, and happy to talk about some of those places. But all of these issues that I've talked about, it has created a lot of places in the credit markets that don't have enough capital. Now, on the short side, we're fairly aggressive right now, too, because we don't think that the high yield and investment grade credit markets realize where we are in the cycle and realize where we may be heading. And the interesting thing about um, the places where there's too much or too little capital is that there's been no capital going into triple C's or single B minus or CMBS or generally CLOs, but there's still plenty of capital in the world. And so all of that capital has gone into double B's and triple B's and straight down the fairway credit. So we think that straight down the fairway credit is mispriced, you know, eligible for shorting just as much as the longs are mispriced in terms of too little credit. So we think it's a very interesting credit picker's market right now. Mm -hmm. Within sectors, what is attractive to you right now? So we are looking for places that can actually grow earnings in the environment that I just talked about, where it's going to be very difficult for um, corporate world to grow earnings. And so where are those places? Those places are generally going to be defensive areas of the economy where they're not as, as affected by the economic cycle. Um, they're generally going to be areas where they've already experienced a lot of the problems that I'm talking about. So their, their employment costs have already gone up a lot. Uh, their, their logistics have gone up, their supply chain has gone up, and we think it may get better. You know, healthcare services is an interesting place for that, where um, they are defensive. Most healthcare services are reimbursed by Medicare, Medicaid, other payers that are not necessarily, um, not necessarily cyclical in their repayments. It takes, a, it takes time for reimbursements to go up with inflation, and that's been part of the problem, but not cyclical. Obviously, demand for healthcare services is not, is not cyclical. You don't know when you're going to need it. And, um, and we think healthcare has been suffering from a lot of the wage inflation issues and the cost inflation issues hurting margins that may actually get better because if the monetary policy cycle works the way we think it's going to work and the way it generally works, wages are not going to grow the way that they have been growing. And so, you know, that's one area we're spending a lot of time on. Other defensive areas, you know, consumer defensives, um, things like supermarkets we're spending a fair amount of time on that have similar elements. And then outside of that, we're looking for, for areas that actually can grow earnings where there's a tailwind. So we're spending a lot of time on Asia reopening, exactly how, you know, how Asia is going to reopen, where, where there's going to be travel, where there's going to be leisure demand. Uh, we think that's a real tailwind, but we're being, we're being very careful and selective on the long side. Rightfully so. Um, and what about real estate sector? That's a pretty hot topic. Yeah, so 
um, real estate has all the issues that we've talked about. First of all, from a valuation perspective, commercial real estate generally is valued 10 year, you know, 10 year treasuries plus two or 300 basis points for a cap rate. So, well, you know, a year and a half ago, 10 year at whether it was at one or two, it was a lot lower than it than it has been recently, although it's it's coming down. That's that's helpful. So commercial real estate valuations are down. The public markets are telling you that. Commercial real estate has a massive amount of floating rate debt. Mm -hmm. That's a big problem in terms of interest coverage. Commercial real estate hedged that rate risk better than levered loans did, but those hedges, the duration of those hedges are coming off, and, and that's still a big problem. And, um, and the capital markets are generally shut on the CMBS side. The regional banks are the problem that they are, and probably not making any new loans in the area. And so, um, so we, think there's, we think there's a big problem ahead. Now, we're generally not long much commercial real estate right now. I will say we have some shorts in the area, but there's a lot that we're looking at on the long side. There are, there are a lot of issues. There are construction loans coming due for big condo towers in major cities. There are urban hotels that are running into issues. There's CMBS. The other thing in real estate is you never have problems in real estate until there is a maturity. There are a lot of maturities coming. There's 500 billion a year for the next two years. So um, where in levered loans, you really don't have maturities until 24 and 25, you have maturities in real estate now, and, and you can see that's causing issues. Mm -hmm. um, so. Are there direct lending opportunities given uh, the wall of maturities coming up in the real estate sector? Uh, yes, we're, we are working on a number of things around the world. Mm -hmm. There is not enough capital in that area. Um, it's, it's one, distressed is an interesting uh, place to invest because you're always, you're always thinking, oh, are things gonna get worse or are there going to be better opportunities a year from now, two years? Real estate is one of those areas right now where things are starting to crack and you keep on asking yourself, is this the time to provide capital? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't I wait for six months? Shouldn't I wait for 12 months? Things are going to get worse. Capital is going to get more expensive. So um, you have to ask yourself that. In, in commercial real estate, we have not done much. We were active during COVID. Mm. Um, we were providing rescue capital for everything from Brooklyn condo towers to the best hotels in Europe to Formula One headquarters, the, you know, all, all sorts of things. Right. Um, so you talked about real estate, healthcare services, and consumer related sectors. What are you avoiding in this market? You know, as a broad-based category, what we are avoiding are generally areas of credit where we think they will probably stop performing mm -hmm. and we think that earnings are not going to grow. So broad-based, we're avoiding the deeply distressed fulcrum securities that we believe supply of those sorts of things is going to increase a lot over the next couple of years. We think default rates will grow. And, you know, we have a saying that the worst go first. And we generally think that those companies that default first as a category are going to be the ones that are subscale, maybe have fundamental issues, maybe have secular issues, and we don't really want to own the business versus some later default candidates 
that just get caught up in you know, the economic cycle and maybe a maturity. And so most of the companies that are running into problems today, we think there's generally some fundamental issue with them that, that we want to avoid. Mm -hmm. And just zooming out a little bit, a lot of private equity firms and their companies have loaded up on debt during easy money times. And those deals were done at pretty flexible terms with not much protection for lenders. Yeah. How is that going to uh, play out in the coming cycle? You know, I think it's the biggest issue in, in distressed investing right now is that, let's say that close to $2 trillion levered loan market. That market is basically a sponsor-owned, you know, corporate market where 15 years ago we would have said, oh, there are plenty of covenants, there's protections, there's financial covenants. Well, today that's basically a covlight market where there are few protections. And then it's a market that is owned 70% by CLOs and 10 to 15% by passive long-only mutual funds or ETFs. And that's the epicenter of potential distress right now because, as I said, a lot of those companies are going free cash flow negative and a lot more will over the next year or two. And those companies are going to need capital first and foremost and who is going to provide that capital and how is that capital going to be provided? As I mentioned, there's not really a near-term maturity issue. The maturity issue is 25 is a maturity issue, 24 is an issue. But those companies are going to need capital and they don't have covenants and they have a sponsor that certainly has to be worried about their equity investment because their company is free cash flow negative and, you know, needs a new capital structure. And so we are, um, we are very busy with sponsors, with companies that need new capital. And the reality of the CLO market, who are 70% owners, is that they can't really provide that capital to those companies. CLOs are rule-based. And especially if something is triple C, that CLO is generally not going to provide new capital. CLOs have rules about diversity and how big their positions are. So doubling down or tripling down on a position is a, is a real problem. And CLOs are, are concerned, obviously, because um, you know that single B minus world, which could become triple Cs, are 30% of levered loans. And if they become triple Cs, they start triggering a lot of issues for CLOs. So CLOs are probably not going to provide that capital. And the king streets of the world are going to have to provide that capital. And so we're spending a lot of time on it. And the reality is there are not covenants. Mm -hmm. And so providing that capital in a way that primes existing holders um, you know, I, there's a there's a panel coming on later that that will talk talk about drop downs and up tiering, but those transactions are going to continue because there's a big free cash flow issue and there's a covenant issue. Mm -hmm. And for King Street, how do you position yourself when you enter or see an opportunity with such yeah light covenants? You have to be very careful. Mm -hmm. If the company needs capital, is free cash flow negative and needs capital, you have to be very careful buying in front of that potential need because if someone comes in and primes you, that's not going to be good for, for your debt. We spend, a, we spend an enormous amount of time trying to understand, does this company need capital? Will we be able to provide capital? Will someone else provide that capital? Um, but I will say, you don't, high level, you don't love these transactions. They're called liability management transactions. You don't love coming in and, and providing priming financing. 
but the reality is private equity funds are just doing what's in their fiduciary duties to their investors to protect their company. And for King Street, actually providing that capital is one of the most interesting things we're seeing in distress right now because it's super senior. The complexity increases the cost of debt on it. So we're providing super senior secured financing to these very good companies that need it at mid-teens yields, short duration, we mature first in the capital structure. It's, it's very interesting risk-adjusted capital, so we're spending a lot of time with sponsors talking about those types of deals as well. Right. And uh, we have a few minutes left. I want to go back to the banking crisis. I know King Street counted um, Lehman Brothers as one of uh, its biggest positions and is now involved in SVB bonds at a HOCO level. How do you think about financial liquidations and why do you like investing in this space? Um, you know, from, from the highest level in distressed investing, what, what we like to look for are very strong underlying assets with interesting supply demand dynamics for the trading of those securities and a lot of complexity where we think there's value add that King Street can, can provide. Um, financial liquidations combine all of those things, Lehman Brothers being probably the, um, you know, obviously one of the, the worst moments in, in financial history, but one of, one of the most interesting distressed investments intellectually of all time because the underlying assets of Lehman Brothers were um, cash, a lot of cash, and financial assets, loans, bonds, things that we're interested in owning, um, PE stakes, hedge fund stakes, Newberger Berman, a lot of interesting assets that we are happy owners of. And there was, uh, there were, you know, close to 200 billion of debt. There were 20 entities around the world that had filed for bankruptcy. In order to possibly value a bond, you had to vault value, you had to know all of those entities in different jurisdictions around the world and the underlying assets in each. So that complexity, there are very few firms. We had, you know, we have 250 people around the world and seven offices. There are very few firms that can possibly analyze that type of situation. So that was certainly interesting to King Street. I'll try not to talk about particular current investments too much, but when you look at when you look at a distressed financial investment and a lot of the value of your recovery is coming from cash at a time that you worry about corporate earnings and you're going to you're going to recover on something that's uncorrelated with the, with the rest of the market and frankly cannot go down in value, it's cash, um, and you're going to be able to invest in something like that at a very interesting IRR, and there's a lot of complexity and a reason why certain players can't analyze it, that, that garners our attention. Mm -hmm. And do you expect another leg to this banking crisis that could provide more of these similar type of opportunities? We'll, we'll end with another tough question. Um, we, we think generally, hopefully for, you know, for our economy, the liquidity crisis with banks is close to the end. We think there's, as is often the case in economic cycles and monetary policy cycles, we think that the market is probably going to turn its attention to the balance sheets of these banks. And this first step, they t the market turned their attention to the duration, the, the interest rate risk of the banks, 
we think that if the economic cycle plays out the way we expect, there are going to be real issues with commercial real estate. There are going to be real issues with consumer loans and small and medium-sized business loans. And we would expect the market to turn to some of those regional bank balance sheets and really put them under the microscope. Uh, that's generally what the market does in the middle of an economic cycle. We wouldn't expect anything different this time. Mm -hmm.